welcome to the GoTo Podcast. Each episode covers the brightest and boldest ideas from the world's leading experts in software development. Tune in for practical lessons, compelling theories, and plenty of inspiration. GoTo gathers the brightest minds in the software community to help developers tackle projects today, plan for tomorrow, and create a better future. Stay up to date with the latest in tech through GoTo's top-rated events held online and in person in cities like Amsterdam, London, Copenhagen, and Chicago, and by subscribing to the GoTo Conference's YouTube channel, where you can find thousands more high-quality dev talks. Learn more at gotopia.tech. All right, James, good to see you. It's been a long time now since we've talked last time. It goes over yeah, to Berlin, right? Berlin, wasn't it? It was a year uh, sitting in the hotel that then a day later the fish tank exploded. Yeah, that, 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 was, that, that was something. Last time we saw that, that fish tank, for, for yeah. those that, that uh, don't know, in Elite Dev Berlin, uh, we were at that hotel where the world's largest fish tank is unfortunately no more. So with that, uh, that I guess is a good unexpected segue. Let, let's do a little bit of introduction for, for those that uh, you don't know. Maybe you can start with that, James, and then I'll carry on. Yeah, that sounds good. So my name is James Stanier. I'm currently um, Director of Engineering at Shopify. And I wrote a book, which is, I think, what we're talking about today, called Become an Effective Software Engineering Manager. And um, yeah, there we go. That's the one. It's the one with the flock of birds on the front. Um, and yeah, really nice to be here. Have a chat. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm interviewing James. I'm Gergay Oros. I write the Pragmatic Engineer. Uh, before that, I was a software engineer and then an engineering manager. And I've also just recently published my uh, first longer paperback book called The Software Engineer's Guidebook. So I guess we have author to author here. But today we're going to be talking about becoming an effective software engineering manager. This is actually a book that I had the privilege to read a little bit before uh, it was out. And uh, I'm, uh, I, I believe, yep, I'm, I'm on, on the back of this with my recommendations. This is a book that I, I really uh, liked um, from, from the start. And I'll, I'll just kick on with why I like the book. So a very kind of typical part of the book is any chapter that you open, what, what I like is it starts with a story. And for example, there's a chapter, there's a humans is hard chapter, which is, I'm just checking, a chapter 10. It's called humans is hard. And when I open that chapter, it starts with the story of you're a manager or maybe you know, even a director or whatever. And your, your, your manager, so your boss is really upset with you because your team has not been delivering for six months and they're telling you you're not working hard enough. And there's a story you're kind of like almost feeling yourself in, in the shoes. Um, I've luckily not been in this situation, but I've seen other managers be in this situation. And then the book goes into like, all right, how do we get here and how do we fix it? And for example, in this chapter, it goes into explaining that as a manager, you're under way more scrutiny, uh, both from, you know, your, your, uh, your, the people that you work with and, and your management. Uh, it goes into the upper you go, the more wobbly things are. You just need to, you know, balance all these things. And, and, and then as a manager, uh, for example, your team is behind schedule. Now, what do you do? Do you use the whip to, you know, tell people are going to work more or, or do you use motivation? And the book is just like, I feel, you know, this chapter was really, it's one of those things where even though I've not been in that situation, that specific one, uh, as a former manager, I really, well, at the time as a manager, I just really emphasize with it. And every single chapter, I really like how it pulls you into this really like real situation. So I wanted to ask, start, start to ask you, uh, about that. Like, are, were these real situations or were there ones that happened to you or, or ones that you observed? Because they feel super real life. Yeah. And I think they all did happen. Obviously not exactly as they're written, but the thing that I noticed in sort of my early years as a manager is that there are just these patterns that you notice. It's the same as writing software. There's software patterns. There's also patterns of organizational function or even, or even dysfunction that you find yourself in time and time again. And I think the way that the book was constructed was to try and make sense of those patterns that I'd seen and experienced and talk to other people and, and who's also seen and experienced them and then try to extract frameworks or tools out of those situations that are then generally applicable to people going forward. Because I think the whole way the book was put together was here's a whole bunch of stuff that I've experienced. Here's how I think if I knew this beforehand, I would handle it better. And then the book was a process of kind of committing that to, to paper as I went through. 
And what what are some like frameworks uh, and tools that that you mentioned? Like what what ones that maybe are a bit more memorable for you? Yeah, so you mentioned a few there. So the one was the kind of the wobble analogy. And you know, if you think of an org chart and the kind of the pyramid shape, and then you think of like a a jelly for our European folks or a jello for our American folks, kind of superimposed over the org chart, you know that if you sort of poke the jelly at the bottom, it doesn't really wobble very much because it's at the bottom. So like little crises can be contained in teams quite well without needing too much um, effort. But the higher the org chart goes and the higher up the top you are, just one tiny little prod can send the entire organization going crazy. So for example, if a CEO gets involved in something and then suddenly there's a burning issue, the whole org chart just goes all over the place and it all wobbles and it's all a mess. So I think what I've tried to do is just kind of extract all these little metaphors and analogies that I think are quite easily memorable so that you can think, ah, okay, this applies to this situation going forward. Yeah. And so how did you get about to writing this book? Uh, you mentioned you're a director of engineering right now at, at Shopify, but uh, I, I guess related to this is both how you wrote the book, but how did you become a manager and you know, pick up these interesting lessons that are now in, in the book in a more condensable format? Yeah, so I was, um, it was pre Shopify that I wrote this book. So I've been at Shopify for a few years and I think I, I finished this three years ago now. So this was very much written during the journey of, you know, getting into management myself. So before the book, like four, four years before the book, as I first became a manager, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, I just was trying to synthesize what I was learning. I think back then, which was probably 10 years ago now, there just wasn't the same amount of books or blogs or newsletters out there that were really there as, a, as an example of how to be a good manager. So really, I was reading around as much as I could, but a lot of the information was either very autobiographical. It's kind of like, here's a book on Steve Jobs and like, I'm, I'm not Steve Jobs, or here's a book on you know Jack Welch or whatever. It's like, I'm not running General Electric. Or they were very sort of pie in the sky. Yeah, very that's abstract. The, I think that book was the uh, either the Jack, Jack Welch one and, and there, there's the other one that's very much recommended. The one I, I I forget the name. I think it's it's not on GE, but there's also one a really big it's a managerial book. Mm -hmm. I, I, I to come, it'll come to me later. But but yes, but they're they're very old books and they're non tech companies. They're uh, kind of more traditional management books. Absolutely, and I think the only one that really connected with me in the the early period, which um you know when I was trying to learn the ropes. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'll rewind a bit. So I was in this startup called Brandwatch, which, you know, we successfully exited 10 years later. It took a long time, but I was there just after the seed round. And I, I joined just at the period where everyone reported to the CTO because there, there weren't enough engineers. And then when we had the seed funding and then some series A funding, it was okay. We need to grow the engineering department. And I always remember when I, I joined, I ended up reporting to the guy who was effectively a, a principal engineer. And I remember our first ever time that we, sat together was him telling me, I don't understand why I'm a manager. Um, I was sort of just told I'm, I'm the most experienced person here, so I need to manage everybody. So I think the company was working itself out as it was growing. And I think I was just very interested in, okay, well, this feels like this isn't how it should be. And then I wanted to do a good job of management. And then I did a lot of reading and then I sort of placed myself as we grew to say, Hey, I'm really, really interested in management as a craft. And I think leading on from that, you know, how do we define career tracks, the dual ladders of management and individual contributors, all of these things started to sort of come out. And back to your question about where the book came from. Well, I started writing a blog post once a week, which was effectively just on my on my website, trying to synthesize what I was learning as I was reading. And this is uh, the, the engineering manager com, right? That's correct. Yeah. So um, I think it, it came from the typical way that it works with uh, techie people, which was I saw that the domain was available and I bought the domain and then I decided to write the blog. But, the, you know, the, the intention was there to to try and write something once a week, just something small, just what I was learning. And I think in terms of, of audience, I didn't really have that as front of mind when I was doing it. Really, I had a few colleagues who were just interested in what I was reading. And I thought that if I could write some stuff that maybe just five of my colleagues would read, that would be a success. And I only really cared about that, really. And um, yeah, just wrote every single week, trying to get better at writing, get better at synthesizing what I knew. And then slowly I saw that, you know, posts we picked up on Hacker News and, and it, it kind of just very organically grew. So it was nice. And to answer your question, finally, sorry, <laughs> the book, when I'd written the blog for years, I sort of stepped back and looked at everything that I'd written and started to sort of categorize it all together and sort of 
something. Okay, there's a sketch of what could be a book here. And uh, I wrote to a few publishers. Um, so I wrote to Manning, wrote to programmatic uh, programmers, and I got on very well with the Prague Prog folks. And they offered me the chance and went from there. Yeah, and then how, how long did it take to, to write the book? So you already had a lot of ideas in the blog post, right? Yeah, so I'd say that the material was was there. So if you put all the blog, if you imagine printing out all the blog posts side by side, you probably had about half a book. But the thing that really took the time was making it all flow as one coherent narrative. And I think as a fellow author, you will you will sympathize with that. Yeah, people just yeah, go, oh, very, you stitched very, the blog post much. together. I think, I think this is the thing that it's 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 hard to maybe emphasize with uh, or or see until you write it because the book does flow well. I, I like that you know there's there's uh, the book has do you have four parts well, or three? I think there's parts? three main no it's, main it's, it's parts, three yeah. three main parts. There's basically an, a, a bit more of an introduction of a like a general stuff orientation. There's working with individuals which which is more of the line manager part. And then the bigger picture, which is feels a bit more like managers of managers and above. So like senior EM and, you know, like you were at, at Brownwatch in, in the end, were you a VP of engineering or senior VP of engineering? Yeah, I was VP of engineering um, yeah. for the last sort of five years of my, my time there. Yeah, which I, I mean, I, I think this is a really nice split because uh, like as w- what I found when I was reading the book, I was reading the book when I was already an experienced engineering manager and I was starting to get my, my first managers uh, uh, under me. In fact, I might have already had a manager under me. And so, for example, for me, you know, the first parts were maybe a bit less relevant because I, I've already kind of gone through the, the one-on-ones, performance management, all that. It was nice to see uh, additional approaches, but the big picture was was really useful for me, which is, and, and this is what, was what one of the things I've heard from uh, friends who I recommended to uh, the engineering managers who are brand new to this, we just really like you know the the beginning, and it's kind of nice. But but for them, the second part was not as relevant. So I think it's it's a pretty it's a good balance because it does cover a lot of it in, in a similar uh, way. Did did you did you find uh, writing some parts easier or harder? Because I guess by the time you were writing this, you were more on the lot more experienced side and further away from the line management side. Yeah, I think I, I wouldn't say there were any individual chapters that were difficult, but I think that as you've probably also experienced now, like it takes writing something down to really understand whether you know something or not. And you can sometimes feel that you really know something and then you try to write it and then you realize you don't know anything about it at all. And I think that's that's the one thing that I've taken away from writing books is that it's the way that you understand what you know and what you don't know. And that certainly those latter chapters, um, I remember when I was writing the one about the dual career tracks, you know, that was all about the time where I think I'd just about put Brownwatch's career tracks on progression.fyi, the oh, yeah. career track yeah. site. So I think I was pretty much writing those kind of like hand in hand. Yeah. And it was kind of like trying to do the chapter that got yeah, me. But to, by the to way, I it. think this is the only book so far. Um, I might be wrong. I may be missing some, but I haven't seen another book that talks about career tracks and putting them into place. I, I get this a lot, a lot, lot of questions from people, especially uh, senior managers or, or people who are, are starting as a CTO role at uh, like a smaller company who want to do this thing. And obviously there's a lot of online resources, but so far this has been the only book. So I, it, it's, it's interesting because I, I feel it, it does go through a lot of the tracks. It's probably helped that you grew with uh, Brandwatch, right? Like by, by the end, could, as context, can you give like how small the company was, was when you joined and then by the time uh, you were kind of finishing this book, how big it was yeah so when i joined i think the company in total was about 20 people and that includes everybody from ceo engineers commercial and at the time that we exited it was it was about a thousand people yeah wow yeah so So you you, you, you went through that growth yeah and i think to answer your question as to why i was able to write about it i think it's essentially because i had the privilege to do that work and I think that's the one thing that, you know, certainly now at a larger company, Shopify, I have influence into these things, but I'm not effectively the decider on what our career tracks are. You know, that yeah. that is above me now. Yeah. So when I wrote this book, I was fortunate to be able to do it. Well, who knows? So the person deciding might be reading this book. So you never know. And and so this book launched uh, three years ago or almost three and a half years ago in May 2020. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was the reception so far? Because uh, now you, you probably got a lot of feedback. Yeah, overwhelmingly positive, actually. I think it's very nice that like every 
in-person conference that I go to, typically I end up meeting someone who says, Hey, I read your book and it was really helpful. And that's, that's the bizarre thing. And, I th and again, I think this is something that you, you know, with your newsletter is that being able to commit things to paper is just such a bizarre thing because it introduces you mentally to other people. And you you meet someone who's read 350 pages of what you've written, probably understands your ideas better than you do now because you've kind of forgotten them a bit since you wrote them down. Yeah. But it connects you with people. And, you know, the sales have been brilliant, sort of like really nice, meaningful five-figure sales. And it's just, it's been a really lovely experience because it's felt that I've connected myself to the world in, in ways that I don't put myself out there typically. So I've I've never really enjoyed playing the social media influence a game but i can write and i think this is really nice because it connected me to people in a way that i feel is more genuinely interlinked with my passion amazing I, I mean you know one thing about management books in in general is you know like i guess one of the best ways you, you've seen this I, i've seen this the, the best ways to get better at managing is to just do it and you're going to make a bunch of mistakes and you're going to learn and if you're lucky and hopefully you are you either seek out mentors or you have mentors but you know like it's it, it's hard to generalize some of these things but you still did generalize things here and i just want want to ask you like how prescriptive of this book uh, is this book and also how do you feel this book is different to the books that you previously uh, picked up on management as as you were becoming a manager because clearly you were trying to do something that didn't exist and, and clearly there's a demand for it so far. So how is this book different and how prescriptive is it? Good question. So I think there's a few things in there. So I think prescriptiveness, there's a little bit at the beginning, obviously the management 101, here's how to run a decent one-to-one, -one, here's how to do a performance review. The very basics, the sort of the, the bottom of the scaffolding of the book is fairly prescriptive, but it's written in such a way to say, this is one way of doing it yeah but by the way I, I did like so like you mentioned there there's one-on-ones there's uh there's hiring people uh there's figuring out how to kind of put people in, in your team figuring out the right motivations for the people uh and then what i really liked is there's how to like how to deal with people leaving uh, and and uh, also just firing people i mean i think this is something that I mean, no manager signs up to do this, but sometimes you have to. So like those parts, I kind of appreciated that it was a bit prescriptive. Obviously, as you said, it didn't say this is the only way to go, but it's a bit reassuring. For example, you, you write that people leaving is normal. Like, mm -hmm. and, and because like whenever this happens, especially as a first time manager, I think you just take it personally. Even if you're just like, you become a manager and like someone stands up and says like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm leaving. So like those parts of being, I guess maybe prescriptive is not the right way, but opinionated, I thought was very helpful of like, okay, this person or James is thinking that this is, it's okay that people are leaving, I guess. Okay. That's good. Cause I was a bit worried <laughs> that it's not. Yeah. And I think it's because, you know, and going back to the motivations for the book in the first place is that typically, and I think the strange thing with management in technology is that everyone enters into the technology industry typically because they are either passionate about programming They've done some education around computer science or programming, and that's their expertise. And then they come in and then they demonstrate that they're excellent at that thing. And then they get to that career juncture in, in the career tracks where they go, I want to do management. And pretty much everybody has not done a course in management. They've not done any formal education. And I wanted to try and almost as a curriculum lay out, here's all of the, the pieces of the pie that you are going to be expected to do. And going back to your question about prescriptiveness, the way that it's written is that I've kept myself out of it. It's very much a book about the hero's journey, which is you as the reader. And that isn't necessarily something that I made up. That's actually why I really like the publisher because um, Pragmatic, they want you to write the books like that. It's, it's part of the editorial um, theme and process. So what I like about the book is I'm not present at all. Obviously I wrote the words, but it's not about me. I don't care about me. You know, I don't want you to care about me. I want you to care about the ideas. That, that's, that's me. And I think as the book goes on and it gets, you know, slightly more abstract, we talk about things like leadership and strategy and how we piece together good culture. This is where the, there are no prescriptions. And I think that something that, again, I really like about books because they give you the, the length and the space to explore is that it acts as a really nice anecdote to 
so antidote rather to a lot of the blog posts that you see get lots of traction these days, which are very much here's seven things that you need to do to be an amazing manager. Here's the three things that you shouldn't do. And it's just, as you say, you have to do it. You have to learn. You have to apply your own pattern recognition to situations and, and try to work out what to do. So telling people exactly how to do a good job at a manager is impossible. Every person's different. Every organization is different. And that's what I quite like about the book is that it, it recognizes that. And it's like, here's a bunch of tools. It's almost like a toolkit that I give to you. Use the tools as you see fit. And here's, here's some guidance. Yeah. And like, it's interesting because I, I've yet to come across a book. Like I was wondering why I, I why I really like, cause I, I really like this book. And I think there's two types of books on management. There's some, again, really good books that are kind of like, all right, here's how you do things. It's opinionated. Uh, it, it kind of lays out different approaches and it's more of a reference book. Um, um, and this one, like, I think the difference is like, as, as soon as I picked up every charter, as you said, it, it, it's not about you as James. In fact, you, I, I never thought of James, but I'll, I'll just like read like three sentences from the book of how a chapter first, which is chapter two, manage yourself first. And it starts and it, it just places like you as a reader and it says, so they started so well. You felt like you ended on a first week high. You met your team and your manager and you made notes uh, that you're going to follow this week. You saw good in the world and the world saw good in you. And then it happened. A production issue that started in your team brought the whole site down. And I'm like, you know, like suddenly I, I just feel like two things. Either like I've actually been in a situation like I come in, it's a great day and then it just blows up. It's, it's an outage production issue. And I'm the manager of the team. So now it's my problem and my responsibility. And of course the book goes on uh, with this, but there's also situations that never happened with me. And I'm reading it, uh, for example, the one that, that I talked about where uh, your, your manager, let's say the VP of engineering walks up to you and saying, like, what is your team doing? We are behind schedule. We need to get this out. Are you guys lazy or watch? Uh, like you've been on this for four months. This is not acceptable. It should have been done in a week. Like I talked with someone else. And so I, I like how it, like, I feel it, it just by even if if someone just reads the introduction of of these uh, the, these um the the book of these like i think 20 something chapters you just get an empathy of what it's like to be a manager even if you're not a manager by the way i think it's, this is a great way to think like do you want to be a manager because these are situations you're eventually going to find yourself into but but more importantly i, I like every, every introduction of, of these chapters just made me pause a little bit and think about it because it is a real situation and it feels that it's about me as, as a reader. So I think that was a really smart choice. And, and you said this was not your choices. You said this was a uh, help from the publisher or how did you come up with, with this? Cause this is a very consistent structure. And I think this is one of the, I guess, trademarks of your book, if I think I might say so. Yeah. I mean, the, the story at the beginning of the chapter thing was, was my idea for sure. The, the hero's journey as how it's generally written is definitely the publisher. But yeah, I did, I did have to pitch them this idea of like some stories and I, I can understand why initially the, the publisher was, are you sure? Because I mean, engineers probably aren't the, the best fiction writers in the world, but I think I sort of managed to pull it, pull it off. And well, I, I, I yeah. feel it's not fiction. I feel it's a bit like Silicon Valley when you watch the series, it's actually just real world. Like if, if you've been there, you know, you're like, yeah, this actually happened. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of jokes. There's little Easter eggs in it. There's little Easter eggs throughout the books, like the the illustrations. You know, I've got my dog in there a few times. If you notice, um, some of the names of the people in the diagrams of people in my family and so on. So there's lots of little little uh, nice touches I try to put throughout it. Nice. So uh, w one of, one of the things I think this book is wonderful for is people who are just new into management or just getting into management. But can we? Talk a little bit about that. I mean, you're, you're an experienced manager. You actually helped a lot of people get into management. Uh, if someone is, is listening now and they're thinking, hmm, I actually want to become a manager one day, you know, like maybe in a, a few months uh, or, or a few years, how would, how, how do you make it happen based on your experience? Yeah, it's a good question. So we've already mentioned that if you happen to join a startup in the earlier days, then if you haven't had experience with it before, you have this wonderful environment around you where lots and lots of people are coming in and these positions will get created and you do have a chance. And certainly, I guess we'll, we'll touch on the current um, mood and economy at the moment where there are limited um, positions in, in our industry where trusting sort of an outsider to come in as a manager with no prior experience rarely ever happens. So certainly if you're looking for it, try and get into a company that is growing or will grow um, because those those slots will open up. 
And if you've already demonstrated that you're good at your job and you, you've demonstrated leadership and the ability to get things done and you're reliable and trustworthy and you have great rapport and all that kind of thing, then you can step into those roles as they, they occur. I think the one thing that is important, though, which is something that we did at Brandwatch and, and also we, we do it at Shopify, too, which is that if someone is definitely high growth and really is intentionally wanting to get into management, you can basically come up with a safety net to say, hey, like, why don't we do this for some fixed period of time, maybe six months, maybe a year? Because I think some people do get worried that, say, you're a senior engineer and you know that you're you're pretty much on the route to being promoted and you get to choose. You're worried about that choice being a one-way gate where if, for example, you go into a management role and either you really dislike it or maybe you're not as good at it, good at it as you think you would be, you get worried that you're going to lose your job. And what you have to do is if, if you're in the position to create an environment where that doesn't have to be the case, but hey, try this out. If it works, then fantastic. If not, then we can always hire externally or give, give the role to somebody else. Because I think you can switch back and forth on the tracks, and it's not so, seen so the, as a failure. The, like you're, you're talking this from perspective of the the decision maker, the manager who is creating this position. But mm. would you recommend, as as someone who is, you know, being offered, like, okay, you know, I'm a senior engineer. Uh, my manager just said, like, hey, Bob, uh, I think you're ready to, to go go into management. Would you recommend? If they don't offer this upfront that we're going to create a safety net, would you would you recommend negotiating uh, something like this, saying like, "Look, I'm 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 open to this, but can we try to figure out a safety net? What what happens if it turns out either I'm not as good, or or this just really doesn't resonate with me?" Definitely speak about it. it I mean, it, it's a, it's for the good of the organization after all for that to be the case, because if it doesn't work out and you get the chance to go back to being a fantastic individual contributor then the organization wins either way. Yeah, that's, I, I, I wish, I think more, more and more places are seeing it like this. So, so I've definitely uh, s- seen uh, these things. You know, I, I used to work at Uber and Uber at some point did not have the best reputation in terms of uh, the, uh, the perception of, of the company or how things were. But I, I will say this, Uber has always had a safe path back from being uh, a manager. So they, in fact, Uber actually, <laughs> like, contrary to popular belief, they're one of the first companies that I've seen to get into to, to, with maybe Facebook who have an apprentice management program. So that means that when someone becomes an engineer manager, they get dedicated training. They, 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 they have a cohort of first time managers and then they have a support group, which I just very rarely see, which uh, again, the, the irony is strong on this one because uh, this actually happened not as a result of, of the negative press, this was there even beforehand. So mm. I guess it's just like, you know, if Uber did this, uh, then there's, it is harder to do for smaller organizations, but as a larger organization, it, it is very useful to do them. And what I have found work well is having this apprentice manager title, which is a safety net itself. It seems, it, it means you're, you're not yet a manager. You're in this like transitionary title. And in the end, you're either graduate or you will go back to where you were. And again, it, it, it might feel a little degrading. I, I was an apprentice manager at Uber. And at, at first I was like, oh, wh- wh- why am I not a real manager? But then I realized later that this was a safety net because there were some people who went back from apprentice manager to software engineer and it was not a stigma. So I, I think, you know, like playing with those titles could be interesting as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. I didn't know about that. That's a really good idea. And and let's talk about management right now in, in 2023 or almost like coming up 2024. Um, how are you seeing the, the world's changing? You're obviously working at an organization, but uh, even more so, you're, you're talking with a lot of uh, other other managers with peers in the industry. Are, are we seeing more demand for managers, less demand for managers? Are, are the skill sets changing? And, and maybe let's, let's let's focus initially on on just line managers, and then we can expand into managers and managers. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think. You know, we, we it's clear that since the pandemic ended, we've had economic woes across the board in many different ways. And we've seen many large companies, uh, tech companies, firing many people in layoffs. It's It's been pretty tragic. And that means that now we have organizations that are not growing. And the one thing that is tricky about management is that you need people to manage. And that's just how it is. So if these organizations are not growing, then there's only the amount of managers that the org can produce. And I think also we've seen during these rounds of layoffs that have happened in many different places that we're trying to also make sure that managers have enough people. And and this has been quite challenging because during a heavy growth period, you're putting managers in place and you're slowly building up teams around them. And then that all stops. 
Yeah. And then you end up managers with have two direct reports, three direct reports. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's been a consolidation of trying to make sure that look, we all need managers. They're essential, but we want to make sure that they have sizable teams that can get things done, clear purposes and so on. So skill sets, I think also is an important thing because the last what 15 years has been like the longest bull market that we've had forever, where it felt like if you were in the right companies in the right time, everything's always growing all of the time. And in terms of bad news that you have to deal with, okay, your project might get canceled or it might pivot. Maybe some people will leave your team. Maybe there'll just be some general sort of work related stress, but very few managers from the, the earlier generations have yet to go through a downturn like we have. Yep. Where you have to deal with layoffs, you have to deal with budget cuts, doing more with less, all of this kind of consolidation stuff. Well, and and, and I guess interesting enough, like not just dealing with you laying off part of your team, but you lay, like, I think it's important to recognize that, like you said, the jelly wobbly, but the higher up you are, the wob more wobbly your position. So a lot of times, like, for example, when we had layoffs at Uber, um, you know, they asked me, like, if... I mean, it was not as direct if we were in Amsterdam, uh, where you, you, that you cannot, uh, like pick and choose who to let go. But, but they still asked me, like, if you had to let go 25% of your team, who would it be? And I just said very clearly, like, okay, well, it will be these people and it would be done because they're the latest joiners and I don't have anyone on performance issues. So, um, but then I was thinking, like, what they didn't ask me is, is about me because a lot of times the manager, you know, like with when these things happen, often you help the company become more efficient, but then your role might become inefficient. In fact, I also know like some companies who, for example, let go of the middle management layer uh, at a scale up. So I, I feel, you know, there's that. Um, this is type of stress that no one really prepared you for it. And I, again, like not to downplay the stress at individual contributors, but I think as managers, you have more information and, and more stress to, uh, deal with and, and especially during a downturn, I feel that stress really, really gets on you. Like I, at, at Uber, I, I remember after the layoffs, uh, uh, most managers were not impacted, but most managers left. Uh, as and you know, I, I keep in touch with some of them, and it was just a lot of stress. Like I don't think anyone was ready for this. So I, I like g given that we have seen this market, and hopefully it'll turn around. But let's let's assume that it'll it'll stay how it is. Like, what are some strategies that you could suggest for for managers, new or existing ones, to cope with this a little bit better, and and to you know find find, find ways to maybe reduce the stress on yourself, uh, have a bit better well being because that's something I don't really see uh, managers focus as much. I think on your book you touch a little bit about this, but I, I'm not sure how much. Yeah, I, I touch a little bit about that, especially in the sort of parts around stoicism and like understanding what you can control yeah, and what you yeah. can't control. And I think that, I mean, in terms of strategies for managers in, in this environment, I mean, I think one thing in the course of an entire career in technology, I think it's highly likely that everybody, and I would probably put myself in that bucket as well, may get let go somewhere at some point because it's not in your control. It's not necessarily something you've done. It's just, it can happen. That's that's the the downside of our industry. It can be very high growth, but also very high opposite of growth, yeah. um, deep growth. It's, vo it's volatile, shrink. right? It's volatile. And so it's, it's, it's never your fault. That doesn't make it any more easy to deal with, but I think you always have to remember that it's not on you. So strategies are, I mean, obviously from an individual level, always try and make sure that you are doing high value work and you're doing a great job. That's all the baseline. Yeah. I think... I've seen some managers being very open about saying, Hey, like if anything happened, I'm really happy to go back to doing individual contributor work. I'm yep. still super high context. I understand all the systems we work on. I can write code. Like you don't see me as just a manager. I can do whatever you need. So having the ability to be a manager, but still be close to the details to still really understand what the yep. team's building to contribute code. If you can, like that's all great as well, because it gives you different paths. But yeah, going back to the, the more sort of philosophical side, you just have to understand that there are things that you can control. There are things that you can't. And for the things that you can't, you just have to try your best and set yourself internal goals where you're like, in this situation, I'm going to do the best for my team. We're going to build the best software we can. We're going to hit all of those goals that we can control. And the wider thing is just not under our control. 
And if it isn't, you just have to learn, learn to let go. And, and that's really challenging. And, and it goes through the whole of life, right? It's, it's not just work. Yeah. And I guess maybe one, one thing I would add is like during the good times or even the decent times, like we do work in technology, which is a pretty good sector in, in many ways in terms of, you know, the flexibility of work, the fact that many of us can work either partially or, or for remote compensation is, is often compared to other industries, just pretty decent. When I look at my peers who, uh, graduated high school at the different industries. So like based on this, like building a nest egg, uh, or, or putting aside some, a little bit of a safety net because it is volatile, right? It can be very good. And then at some point it, for a short time, hopefully it, it can, can drop. But I feel just having that safety net, it just gives a peace of mind. Uh, because yeah, as, as you said, the reality is like, I, I've unfortunately seen this, you know, people uh, like very specifically at Uber have, have joined and uh, COVID hit, uh, the company had to have layoffs. Like I, I saw, I saw the numbers. It, it, this was not one of those, the stockholders are doing something. It was actually just like revenue was going to zero, like li literally like on, on, on the graphs. So the company had to let people go. And those, those were people in my case who have recently joined, but they obviously joined with high hopes. Uh, and most of them, in fact, I think everyone I, I know within a few months, they were back in a, a different position, but I'm just going to assume that the ones that did have a bit of a safety net of a few months, they were probably just a lot less stressed and, and a lot more picky and uh, g getting up in, in whatever that next role is. So yeah. that, that's, that's probably something that we should all, all remember that like when it's good times, it's, it's good to like, I, I feel until now we've always assumed there will be good times. Uh, now it's a bit of, you know, not as good, but it, it, it just goes up and down. So just you know, save up where you can. Yeah, I, I completely agree. There's like basic sort of personal finance things where, you know, if you are fortunate to get a good job in technology that pays well, don't spend that much money, yeah. you know, save it, put it aside. See if you can get three months of uh, emergency savings, six months of emergency savings, maybe even a year where, you know, you give yourself that, that safety net so that you can definitely ride out any bad times. Um, you know, don't get that promotion or that new job and then suddenly buy a bit house that's twice as big and assume you've got that pay forever. Never do that ever. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's good advice. So, uh, can, can we just touch on like three of your favorite ideas in the book uh, that, that, that you go through that are maybe unique to this book or, or well, unique to you? Yeah. So I guess the, the first one that comes to mind is the, the diagram around uh, delegation. Um, and delegation is such an interesting thing because it sounds very basic. It's kind of like give someone some stuff to do and they'll do it. But I think that's where managers get that wrong a lot because delegation is kind of an art and it's, it's sort of a, a gradual spectrum where fundamentally, yes, you are giving people things to do, but the important thing is as a manager that you are still accountable for those things getting done. And I think that's where managers can sometimes get it wrong and they abdicate. They just give things to their staff and then just abdicate all responsibility and accountability to them. Fundamentally managing well is always remaining accountable for everything in your organization that you've delegated out. And the way that you delegate is also, it depends on how skilled or experienced or high context the individual is. If someone's extremely skilled, then you can delegate a thing to them. They'll tell you when it's and done. I'm just showing the oh, diagram yeah. that, the that, that you were there, talking yeah. about. This is the delegation spectrum. It's a bit hard to see here. But I, I feel, you know, in an image, it, it kind of explains what you just did, but with a glance, basically, like how much you delegate and how much control you have. Yeah. And I come back to that all the time. I've, I've used that as a coaching point in my stuff over and over again since I wrote that book. Uh, another one, contracting, is something I learned from some management training they did at Brandwatch, which was great. And it's all to do with those kind of like awkward first few times that you meet new staff or even your own manager you can this works upwards as well but how can you at the beginning of a management relationship spend some time with someone to really understand what is it that they want from you what do you want from them what are some of the ways that it can work really really well what are some of the ways that it could go terribly wrong and also how can you let you know let each other know when there's a problem and then it just sort of at the beginning of a relationship just by preparing some answers to those questions and sharing them with each other you can really understand like what you both need or want from each other and how you can sort of frame and build scaffolding around your relationship. So it's successful going forward. That so works super so well. you, you, you call this a contracting exercise. So I guess this is a bit of a getting to know how the other person works, prefer preferences, etc. in a, what sounds like is a little bit more formal way that can also be just very efficient, right? Yeah, it's sort of almost like we're seeing a manager read me type thing collaboratively together where you really understand how they work. 
you understand how you work and you share and you try and ahead of time spot ways in which you may have friction or ways that you can work together really well. Mm -hmm. And it, it does look kind of formal, but I've done it with every member of staff that I've had since I wrote the book. It's really useful. Okay. So I guess it's one of those things which like, I feel a lot of managers like, ah, that sounds like very, uh, you know, old school or formal or like, again, like I think as engineering managers, we want to think of ourselves as cool and, you know, approachable, but you said you've done it. So like, okay, well, I guess uh, if, if you're a manager listening, uh, either check the book or, or just as we described, I, I don't think you need the book specific for this. You, you can try it out and probably hopefully be surprised. Just like yeah, we can stuff. stick the it's on on the on the blog as well, so I can stick a link in the uh, description. Awesome, we'll, we'll have a link there. And then we already touched on it. Just as the last thing was was really the the sort of the the stoicism part, which um, there's a a really good book called the uh, The Ancient Art of Stoic Joy, which by William B. Irving, I think it's called like How to Live Well, and you know it really it really just dives into sort of the the trichotomy of control, which is like three things, like the things that you control, the things that you don't. And then the things where you have some influence and you can try your best. And I think that very much sums up what it's like to be a manager because you kind of exist in this kind of vortex of things that you definitely can control amongst a whole whirlwind of things that you don't. And really just understanding so what you can is, affect. Is, is this about just like, so I also get it, like it's just like acknowledging what are the things that you cannot control and like not being stressed out about it like and focusing on the things that you can control which might you know help influence some of the other things but ultimately it's not your decision is that absolutely it? okay yeah okay. and it's seeking clarity throughout all of that really it's like how do you lead a team confidently and work on a team confidently in a way that shows that you are in control of everything that you can be in control with but knowing that fundamentally things can happen that, that are really nothing to do with you and we, we touched upon the economy I, I think this is a good one. I, I just recently talked with the VP of engineering whose company was acquired and uh, he was telling me that the next day uh, the new company is going to decide who to fire. And uh, well, because it's, it's, it's a, like it's m and went through and they're going to fire like 10% of staff or something like that. This was known. And so he didn't know like how much of his team would be fired exactly and if he would be fired. And I, I was asking like, are you worried? And he said like, well, I am a bit worried, but my grandma told me that worrying is just moving back and forth, but not going anywhere. <laughs> and I was thinking, wow, that's so apt. So he, he was like, look, I, like, I'm trying not to worry because it's out of my control, but I feel as a manager, a big part of the challenges that I've seen is there's just, you get so much information and you start to worry about so many things. For example, again, you know, like uh, the negative thing is layoffs when layoffs are coming and if, uh, this is happening, but even the positive with promotions, you know, like we had a promotions committee. Uh, well, you have your, your person, uh, person on your team, uh, is about to be promoted. You really want them to be promoted. You put in the case and then someone else is going to decide. And I found myself worrying so much about this where, whereas now knowing what I know, I, I would have been just like, I put in the effort. I'm going to walk away. It's not on me. Uh, and, and take it from there. So I, I feel this is a very easier said than done, but, uh, uh maybe managers will be better off, uh, reading and, and listening to some of this, uh, these stoic, uh, thoughts. There's a lot of literature on this, isn't there? Yeah, there's that Ryan Holiday's blog and podcast, The Daily Stoic, which is excellent. But I think it's to, it's to do with like, then you build on that to be transparent. If you know what you can control and what you can't control, then you can be incredibly transparent with the team in a way that then doesn't make you feel like you are responsible for all of the outcomes. And, yeah, and I, I think that's really important because like the best managers I've seen uh, are the ones who just felt calm. So I went to them like, oh, we have a production outage and like, it's okay, relax we're handling it right now. Here's what we can do. Here's what we're going we're gonna to do. And the worst managers have been the ones, well, not the worst, but the ones that I, I just were not helpful, who were like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, okay, this is bad. This, uh, uh, and I feel it had to do with those managers, and I'm not going to say it's through stoicism, but they found their peace. They they knew they knew what they can do. And and when they did, you know, they were very decisive, right? Like, so th those those managers, they're sometimes calm, but sometimes they said like, okay, we're doing this right now. This is urgent. Uh, but, uh, and I, I feel it's like finding that peace, finding that, which over time, I think it, it came to you, but if you can speed it up uh, with mental models, it's it's a great thing to do. So this is, this, this has been really nice, James, go, going through the book, but, uh, you know, with just one note, this is not your only book, right? Uh, no, what, what other book do you have or books? 
So I have a, a book called Effective Remote Work, which if you like the style of, of this book, um, it's all to do with how do you work remotely well, both for yourself and your organization, you know, very similar kind of narrative arc of individuals, teams and, and company, but to do with how to do remote properly, um, which is very relevant to how I work now. And there's another book on the way, which is where we address the middle management layer upwards, which is very much where I live in, uh, in my current world. And um, I'm writing that right now, so I'm, I'm maybe about a third of the way through. So that's the next year thing. Uh, is, is the title done or, or, or not yet? Uh, TBD. TBD on the title. I do TBD. that at the end. Okay, so, so that, that, that's expected to be middle management and, and up. Yeah, so it would deal with sort of like middle management to executive at large orgs. No, that, that is very exciting. And, and I have this book, the Software Engineer's Guidebook. So I feel this is a really, really good series because if you're a software yeah. engineer, there's this book. If you're an engineering manager or a senior manager, you have the, the, your book, Become an Effective Engineering Manager. If you're working remote, <laughs> you have a book yeah. on, on working on that. And then if you're an executive, uh, who, who knows, you'll, you'll have something coming out. But uh, again, well, well, thank you. This was a really good discussion. And, and again, uh, I still feel like there are more books coming out in, in management, which I think is very good. But this feels to me of one of the most hands-on ones where it does feel you have someone sitting next to you. And, and just to close it, I really like the stories and the fact that it's, it's, it has opinions, but it doesn't force it on you. Uh, this book is three years old, but it feels very relevant for me, especially that we still don't have any 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 manager training. The only thing I say is, if, if you do have an apprentice management program, you might be able to skip this book. Otherwise, I I still recommend it. Thank you very much, and congrats on getting yours out. Cause it, two weeks ago, three weeks ago now. Yeah, it was, it was two and a half weeks ago, so it's it's, it's still very fresh. Awesome. Thanks very much. Been a pleasure. Same. See you later. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Go To Podcast. Head over to gotopia.tech to discover lots more content from the brightest minds in software development.